I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the Provost Candidate interview this afternoon. I'm Nancy Cox, and I'm co-chair of the Provost Search Committee, along with Eric Monday. And we appreciate your being here to uh, review the candidacy of Dean David Blackwell. A few logistical details. Um, there are two ways to ask questions. You can go to one of these microphones in the front of the room, or you can raise your hand and I'll bring you one if you're real shy. And then if you're even more shy, you can fill out a note card and pass them forward. And um, um, so you can raise your hand to receive a note card. We, uh, we have appreciated a lot of great dialogue in the interview so far. So uh, we, we look forward to that this afternoon. For those of you watching via live stream, you can submit questions as well to this forum by emailing provostsearch, no spaces, provostsearch at uky.edu, or you can tweet uh, by tweeting at UKY Provost. Uh, the search website, which I think you've all gotten email on, is uh, uky.edu forward slash president forward slash provost search with no spaces. Um, another real important thing is that we will all have a chance to provide input uh, through, these, uh, through these various sites, including the website, and until noon on Tuesday, December 12th. So please get your comments in um, by that time. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to uh, Dean Blackwell, who will first make some comments and then open the floor for questions. Let's welcome Dean Blackwell. Thank you. I'm testing. Okay, it's, it's on. Thank you. Um, well, congratulations. I think that we've set a record for attendance in Kincaid Auditorium at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. So uh, thank, thank you for being a part of that. Um, and, and sincerely grateful at, at the, uh, the level of participation in, in all of the, the forums today. And I know it takes a lot of time to, to participate in the process, but it is very important. And, and, and I want to thank you. Um, I will just give you an outline of, of uh, how, how I uh, see my remarks proceeding, but I was asked to give my, my view of uh, the current state of higher education. And can, can we turn the mic down a bit? That's better, thank you. <clears throat> uh, the current state of higher education, and then I'll, I'll try to touch on some of those issues as they relate specifically to uh, the University of Kentucky. And, and emerging from that then are, are some opportunities and challenges that, that I see for the university. And, and then that, that will sort of lead to uh, uh, me expressing why I, I think that, uh, I'm, well, why I'm interested in the job, first of all, and I am interested in the job. I, I wouldn't be here if, if I weren't. But uh, why I think I have, uh, why my particular skill set at the moment is, is perhaps uh, the right set of skills for what is facing the university ahead. Uh, then um, I'll just speak a little bit about my vision for how the office of the provost would operate, or at least how I would envision it operating, and then discuss a few immediate priorities that I see for, for uh, the provost and, and the office of the provost, and perhaps then some longer longer term priorities. So the immediate priorities are things that are currently um, you know, on the front burner, so to speak, and, and probably need some immediate attention. So that, that, will, that will come. So uh, really, a, a few things on the current state of higher ed. I know uh, every, everybody in here uh, probably sees the landscape as, as well as I do and, and read a lot of the same uh, sources that I read. But, let me just summarize at a high level where I see things going. One is uh, competition. Um, the entire industry is going to be more competitive, uh, largely uh, because of demographics. And we, we are aware that the high school demographic is at best uh, flat, uh, if not shrinking nationwide. There are certainly a few states that are growing, and that's largely due to uh, migration and, and, and other patterns. Uh, and, and certainly in Kentucky, uh, our, our uh, high school demographic is, is, not, is not growing. Um, also culture, uh, meaning we, we need to be sensitive to how students in the current generation uh, like to learn and how they best learn. And so we, we need to stay in tune with that, 
uh, because I can tell you that universities around the country are, are in tune with it and, and are uh, designing programs and, and methods of delivering instruction that are able to reach those students. So we need to be aware of those issues in the competitive landscape. Um, technology, of course, is, is uh, disrupting in some cases uh, our industry and we are, uh, you know, we're, we're behind, but that presents a, a good opportunity for us and, and I'll talk a little more in detail about those issues later. But uh, at last, and maybe, you know, certainly of, of at least equal importance is the notion of, of diversity and, and the climate on, on campus. And uh, I, th I think we need to recognize that while there is a moral imperative for uh, diversity and for, for building a, a community of, of, of belonging, uh, there's also a competitive dimension to that. And parents, uh, the, the, the prospective students, employers of, of our graduates, all are demanding uh, a, 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 an inclusive climate on ca campus, but also a diverse set of people on campus in all of the, the roles that we have, faculty, staff, and students. And at the, at the most practical level, and I, you know, I spent time in industry, uh, the demand for diversity in industry is, is tremendous. And if we don't have the kind of climate on campus that, that attracts people from all over the world and from all walks of life and, and, and uh, all of the various uh, ethnicities, uh, religions, and so forth, we, we're not gonna be competitive in uh, supplying a workforce that uh, our employers want. So that, that becomes imperative. Uh, the, other, the other overriding theme that we see in higher education is return on investment. Um, and that is something that is getting very close scrutiny again by parents, by prospective students, by policymakers. Uh, we, we, have, we have to remain affordable, and that limits our options of dealing with financial uh, challenges in the future, and we have to be, be mindful of that. On the other, on the other end uh, is, is the, are the outcomes, and not just student success in terms of retention and graduation rates, but also what happens to our students after graduation. You know, what are their post-employment outcomes? And are, are we as a university delivering on, on the promise that, that's implicit, I think, in our land-grant mission of help, helping people to um, improve their lives, uh, not only uh, in terms of uh, intellectually, but also in terms of their, their economic stability and economic well-being throughout their life? Uh, are we really delivering on, on that promise? And that, that speaks to how we prepare students for the workforce and, and the types of positions that they can uh, hope to achieve. Um, of course, more recently, and, and, and maybe uh, indicative of a, of a, a longer-term change in, in the political climate is uh, the, tax, the tax bills that are, are currently pending and, and also other regulation. Uh, we're, we're looking at the possibility of taxes on endowment income of private universities uh, we're looking at the possibility of, of graduate students who are in assistantships being taxed on their tuition waivers and, and even the uh, possibility of, of employee tuition benefits being taxed. Uh, all of those you know, uh, raise, raise the cost and, and really, in a sense, impose a, a tax on, on uh, the, 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 the traditional student uh, in, in terms of how we you know, how, how we're going to address, address that issue. And we need, uh, we need to be thinking about that and, get, and getting ahead of it. And then more generally, regulation uh, from the Obama administration that is uh, not yet, yet rolled back, but certainly there's a bill uh, that came out of the Senate Education Committee in the last couple of weeks. Uh, this bill um, really op opens up the landscape for for-profit uh, institutions to uh, compete uh, on a more on a more favorable footing than in the past, um, and so we need to be aware of that. the the last The last uh, issue, and this is again cuts across all of public higher education for sure, 
and that's the uh, sustainability of our funding sources, and in particular, uh, state support for higher ed. Um, it, you know, it has bounced back in, in a number of states around the country, but given the situation in Kentucky, especially with the, uh, the, the, the governor's focus on the pension crisis and how that is going to be handled, uh, there, there's a huge potential impact on, on higher education, and we need to be ready for that. So th that's, that's sort of the, the current major themes in the landscape that I see at the very macro view, but um, it, I think those, those are going to be the uh, kind of situations that uh, confront us and, and will we'll guide what the next provost needs to, to handle. Um, for UK in particular, the, uh, our issues uh, with, we, we need, I think we need to focus on, given these, the, the climate, um, stability in our enrollment, and, and also thinking about how do we grow enrollment, because I, I think we would prefer to grow our way out of these fiscal challenges rather than, rather than cut, cut our way out. And uh, there are lots of opportunities for growth here. I think we need to figure out on, the, on, on enrollment growth, is it, where, you know, where are the opportunities at the graduate level, at the undergraduate level, what programs uh, make sense, and how do we incentivize those programs and, and then invest in them up front. Um, of course, state funding, we're expecting you know, probably to go down in this next session, and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, there, there is already underway at the university a, a set of of task forces addressing sustainability, financial sustainability of the university, uh, coming up with uh, ideas to, to generate more revenue, but also to be more efficient in uh, how we operate and save, and save money. Uh, those task forces are currently working. We'll have an initial set of reports by December 20th, and then uh, at, after the turn of the year, uh, those groups will be expanded to really start sifting through those ideas and prioritizing them. And, and so we, we are thinking about how to address these issues over the next five years. Um, student success will continue to be a priority for us, not, not just because we, we, it, it is uh, imperative, but it's also a competitive, uh, uh, a competitive necessity for us to, um, to uh, ensure our students are progressing and graduating. But I think the added element related to the ROI, again, is, is uh, post-graduation outcomes. Are the students getting into good graduate programs, if that's the path they want to go to? Are they, are they finding careers in which they can be uh, successful and in meaningful careers and careers that allow them to, uh, to, to, to repay the debt that they may have incurred to fund their, to fund their education? And then, um, in, in, in the landscape at UK, I think some of the opportunities are, are multidisciplinary. Um, certainly on the research front, we've, we've seen a lot of success on uh, external funding of multidisciplinary research initiatives, uh, especially, especially in, the, in, the, in, the health, in the health professions and health sciences. But where we, we don't have a clear picture of how to move forward is on multidisciplinary academic programs. And, and so I think that the next provost uh, needs to work with the, the, uh, the governance structure, the, the faculty, the university senate, to figure out, okay, how, how do we get these multidisciplinary academic programs through, through the process? Uh, who owns the program? Who grants the degree? How, how, are the, how are the resources allocated to get such programs executed and, and so forth? And I think we we need that structure. It needs to be clear, uh, in addition to the financial incentives, to uh, enable that growth in that direction. Um, I'm very optimistic. Uh, we've got a lot of strengths here at the University of Kentucky, and I've got a long list of them. Uh, I'll maybe just focus on a, on a few, but uh, I'm going to start with excellent faculty. And when I was recruited to come here uh, almost six years ago, uh, I certainly in the Gatton College noted that that was a position of, of strength for us going forward, is that we already had an outstanding faculty. We, did, we didn't have enough of them, but we, the ones we had were great. And, and we've, we've, we've grown that and improved that. And I, as I look across campus, um, 
it, it seems that we've done an outstanding job in the last six years since I've been here of hiring new, new faculty that are, that are truly uh, great researchers, great teachers, and, and very engaged. And, and so I think that gives us a position of strength. And if we aren't already uh, a world-class faculty, we're certainly very close to, to becoming a truly world-class competitive uh, faculty. We do have outstanding facilities that have emerged all over campus, uh, classroom buildings such as this one, residence halls, dining facilities, student center, uh, research building, uh, law school. I mean, th these all improve our, our, competitive, uh, our competitive profile and, and certainly improve learning uh, and improve the research product. But we, we, I recognize that there, there needs to be more of that. Clearly, there's other facilities on campus that need refreshing or, or where we need to replace them. But given what we have now, we're much, much better positioned than we were uh, five, six years ago, and that, that is an advantage for us. Um, we've got a great, a great brand. Uh, the brand definitely extends nationally and, and is certainly a, in some dimensions international, and I, I think that is always a, a good starting point to have. Um, and I'll, I'll mention the uh, strong research profile uh, of the university uh, the, uh, on, on all the metrics that, that we typically think about. We're, we're doing very well. Uh, we're, we're truly uh, um, moving up the ladder of research intensive universities and I, I think that's a credit to, to our faculty and, and staff that work in those areas. Um, the, other, the other strength that I see, is it's, it's a double-edged sword, but we're very affordable, okay? And um, that is an advantage. I mean, we, we, we have, uh, a, our, our certainly resident tuition is very reasonable when you compare to, to uh, uh, anywhere in the country, and our non-resident tuition is also very competitive. So I, I think we should view that as an advantage. We know that we're not going to be able to raise tuition much, if, if at all, in the foreseeable future. So that necessitates growth, but given our competitive pricing, we should be able to uh, be able to grow and, and grow with non-resident students or international students that also improve the diversity of the campus. And uh, the, the, la the last strength I'll mention, and. It, it's, it's, in, it is in the, it's in the water here, it's definitely in the culture, and it's a dedicated faculty and staff that care, that, that sincerely care. And uh, I experienced it firsthand when I arrived, but I've heard so many stories as I've met with alumni or met with parents of students or met with new students. Uh, and I remember one uh, meeting a student who came uh, from, from Long Island and I was surprised that we'd actually attracted a student from Long Island, New York, to the business school. And I, I, asked, I, asked, I remember asking the student, well, what, why'd you come down here? And they were on their way to Florida for spring break, pulled off the interstate to check the place out, and you know, I walked across campus, had some question, and somebody was extraordinarily nice to them, and, and it stuck, and so they, they came back. And that's just one example, but I've heard that story repeatedly. Um, uh, you know, over the, over the six years I've been here, and, and I do think that's in our blood, it's in our culture, and it's a big strength. And, and we need to push that as we're thinking about how, to, how we grow going forward. Uh, opportunities uh, that, that I see, uh, we definitely have untapped uh, synergies in research, and I think we need to discuss how we can organize ourselves better, incentivize ourselves better to take advantage of those. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, we need to grow, and I do think that we have capacity to grow. Uh, certainly, uh, as, as provost, I would have to study where that capacity is and, and what the opportunities are in terms of academic programs that are in demand, but, uh, but I do believe we have the capacity to grow and, and we do need to take advantage of that. When it comes to non, what I'll just call non-traditional education, uh, not, you know, non-credit, lifelong learning, online education, online degree programs, uh, workforce development initiatives that we could contribute to, it is, it is virtually a blank slate. I mean, we do have some online programs. We do have the beginnings of a good infrastructure to, to develop those. 
Um, but the, the good news is, is that given that you know, we're, we're still relatively new in that business, we, we have the opportunity to start uh, from the ground floor, really, and, and, and do it correctly. And this could be a way for us to leverage not only our, our faculty, our physical spaces, but also to generate revenue that we're going to need to fill the budget gaps in the coming years. And then international and, and local partnerships. Uh, there's still tremendous demand for U.S. higher education in, in China in particular. I think we've just begun to, to, uh, to really tap that opportunity. Uh, I, I think we should continue to focus on it. Um, but also uh, local partnerships. And, uh, you know, the university for the last couple of years has been in, in discussions with Prairie View A&M University, which may, may sound rather odd, but um, there's a potential pipeline there of, of, of minority graduate students that we could attract to UK if we can, you know, make, make, the, path, make the pathway clear for them. And uh, so we're continuing to gauge there. And I figure if we can make partnerships with six universities in China, we can also work in Texas. But how about even more locally uh, with schools like Berea or Georgetown or Transylvania or the Bluegrass Community and Technical College? Uh, what kind of partnerships can, can emerge there that, that uh, tax or that, that utilize our capacity uh, in, in very creative ways and, and to help uh, create, you know, more, uh, uh, generate more degrees from, from UK and, and take advantage of, of our capacity in that, in that uh, sense. So given all of those challenges, opportunities, why, why am I interested uh, in the job? And, I think the challenges and opportunities that I described really require a number of traits. And, and one is uh, servant leadership. That, that may be a concept that is familiar to a lot of you. I, I try to practice servant leadership. In short, what that means is that you're a servant first and a leader second. And throughout my career, I've, I've prided myself on helping my colleagues and my students to succeed. Uh, that's the, that's my view of a leader in higher education is that you're, you're helping your colleagues and students to succeed. It's, 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 not, about, it's not about you, it's about serving, serving them. Uh, I think an academic entrepreneur is needed. Someone with entrepreneurial vision in an academic context that can help design a framework under which uh, innovation will, will thrive. New programs, innovative programs, improvements, to, to existing programs. To make, to make all of those sorts of things happen uh, requires someone who's a collaborator, a sincere collaborator, and, and I, uh, I do my best to coll collaborate. I've worked with a lot of people all over campus, many in this room. Um, I, I see that as the way to, to, to get things done. Um, it's, it's not about silos, it's about reaching across units and, and finding ways to to grow this enterprise. Um, and then it requires an understanding of all the academic areas on campus. You know, that doesn't mean I or any other provost candidate understands every single discipline in, in the university. But it requires someone who has a sincere appreciation for everything from the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, the, the sciences, and of course the healthcare professions. And we're, we're fortunate that we've got all of these, all of these uh, uh, disciplines represented on, on one campus that's fairly walkable. Um, and and I, I do believe that in six years here and a long career in higher education, I've, I've developed a, an appreciation for the value of, of all, all disciplines. And then the added bonus uh, that, you, that you get from me is a business background. And if you think about the challenges faced by the university, it's not that uh, everything that uh, works in a corporate setting would work here, but I think the mindset of how, how does one actually measure uh, input and output? How does one assess demand? How, how does one allocate resources to their highest and best use to achieve the overall objective of the organization? These are things that, that I studied as a researcher that I've taught and that I've practiced in industry. So I, I, do, I do think that uh, that's it's an added bonus and, and uh, certainly 
uh, enhances our ability to meet the challenges ahead. So the, the bottom line, and, and I um, mentioned this this morning, and I'll mention it again because not many of you weren't there this morning, but we teach our students in the business school that when you go to an interview, you need to ask for the job, okay? That, that's key. So I'm, I'm just gonna go on the record, I want the job, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and why, why do I want it? I, I want it because I have a, a sincere desire to serve. Um, I sincerely believe in the University of Kentucky and, and what it represents, not, not only to the, the faculty and the staff and the students and the alumni, but also to the state. And uh, I love Kentucky. I, I've really um, come to call this home and I hope to continue to call it home. And, and so I'm, I'm sincere in my desire to serve. So the vision uh, for how the provost area uh, might operate, and this is really high level, but uh, my view is the provost area is the heart of the university's mission. I mean, that's, that's where the faculty reside, that's where we, that's where we touch the students. Um, and, and so uh, what, what, what should we be looking for? I mean, the provost area, I think one, should be efficient. Uh, we, we should be efficient with the resources that we have. We should provide excellent service and we have to facilitate and, and augment all of the academic missions on campus. Um, but most importantly, at this point in, in time, is the provost's office needs to facilitate the creation and, and kind of the management, if you will, of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that is needed to, to, to grow the academic enterprise, the research enterprise, and the healthcare enterprise. A few immediate priorities, um, things that I, that I see that, that need uh, immediate attention, and some of these are, are things that I've observed on my own. Some have come up from the discussions I've had in the interview process for, for the provost role, but um, num number one is it, it's going to take some time for me to go around campus and learn and listen. Um, there's a, a lot of people on the campus. It, it is a, a broad array of disciplines, but I have a lot to learn. I recognize that, and I will be, you know, wearing out my shoes all over campus to to meet, to meet with you and, and to learn. Um, I, you know, we we do we do have some in issues with enrollment management, and there's you know there's already a great focus on enrollment management. Um, we've got some challenges there. It's gonna be critical for us uh, uh, in the future to maintain our sustainability. And, and so um, as, 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 soon as, as soon as the decision is made, I will get, get involved in that situation and, and contribute what I can. Um, there's, and you heard me mention earlier that there is a sustainability project going on, very broad across campus. And essentially that is being coordinated uh, by by the EVPFA and, and by the provost. And uh, so I think immediately uh, uh, the, the next provost will have to step in and facilitate progress on that project. Uh, the next stage being to kind of vet the ideas that come out of stage one and then the stage after that is really implementation. And, and that's something that's gonna require a lot of attention over, over the first, uh, first 90 days. Uh, the, other, the other thing coming up, of course, is a legislative session. And <clears throat> um, I want to contribute what I can uh, as appropriate to the efforts to help the president, to help the, the, the vice president, Tom Harris, and others with advocating our case in Frankfurt, uh, assembling the data, uh, actually proving that we, we are achieving the mission that that we, we think we're achieving and documenting that, presenting it in an effective way to the legislature. Uh, that, that's not the provost's role, but I think the provost can help the president with making that case, and, and that's something I think that will require immediate attention. Uh, longer term, my longer term, I'm thinking, you know, first six months of the year, not, not necessarily the next five years. But uh, one, one issue that has come up in, in the discussions today and, e and even before is the future of graduate education at the University of Kentucky. Um, there have been a lot of 
a number of blue ribbon panels and committees and consulting reports and studies. Um, I, I, I think there's probably been enough studying and, and writing committee reports. I think it's time for someone to really digest everything that we've learned, uh, you know, pull in the right constituencies to, to analyze it and discuss the issues and then move ahead and implement something. I think the uncertainty is paralyzing in, in a number of ways and, and getting that resolved uh, sooner rather than later is important. Why? Because part of the potential area for growth is, is in uh, graduate programs. I, I think that may be where we have more capacity rather than necessarily bringing in more, more freshmen. And uh, the other is to grow the research enterprise. If you think about the long run financial sustainability uh, of UK, we have to grow the research enterprise and the, and the graduate programs, the doctoral programs are essential to that. So I, I think that becomes an important priority. Um, incentivizing and resourcing diversity efforts on campus, I, I think is, is important. Uh, incentivizing and, and uh, resourcing efforts to generate more external research funding are important. That's gonna require the provost to kind of break out of the silo and, and, and work very carefully and closely with the vice president for research and the vice president for diversity and, and to come up with, with, with plans and uh, ideas for resources to, to keep those dimensions moving forward. And then la last but, but by no means least is the development of you know, what I've been calling this uh, academic entrepreneurial ecosystem. What, what, what are the necessary incentives to spur the growth that we need? You know, what, what does the structure look like? And uh, where do the startup resources come from? I, I think that, that is an issue that needs to be tackled certainly uh, within the first six to nine months of, uh, of the new provost's uh, uh, tenure. And will involve, will involve lots, of, lots of constituencies on, on campus uh, in that conversation uh, to, to figure out the, the right way to proceed. Thank you uh, for listening to my remarks and I look forward to the conversations for the rest of the time we have together. Please, please ask questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Hello, my name is Nadia al uh, You mentioned several times during your remarks uh, about the importance of finding sustainable sources of funding. Uh, under your oversight, the Gatton College accepted a multi-million dollar donation from the Koch Foundation, which has been known to use its monetary influence to influence the content taught and the professors hired in economics departments, particularly in order to promote free market, anti-regulation economics. Do you see a problem with the involvement of politically motivated interests in public universities? And how would you as provost protect academic freedom? Thank you. Um, so uh, there, there are a number of, of premises behind that question that I, that I won't address specifically. But uh, let, let, let me say it's, uh, a, a bit about the nature of the gift that uh, the Gatton College received from uh, the Koch Foundation and from, from John Schnatter, by the way, who is a prominent citizen of, of Kentucky. Um, f first, uh, the gift that we received uh, is not to promote anything other than honest scientific inquiry into the impact of free enterprise uh, uh, and on, on society. And embodied in that largely is a study of how um, you know, certain government policies might affect uh, uh, economic well-being of, of society. As long as the faculty involved in that institute are practicing uh, standard, intellectually honest research practices, subjecting that research to uh, peer review in our best journals and, a, and, a, and achieving that kind of success, and then hosting events that really open up the discussion to both sides of any kind of issue related to economic freedom uh, and, and that are honest and that are transparent, those all are consistent with the goals of the Gatton College and the goals of the University of Kentucky. Um, in general, I don't ask the, 
political affiliation of, of a donor when they write a check to UK. Uh, politics really has nothing to do with it. Um, in, the ha in the case of the Koch brothers, yes, they, they are involved in, in, uh, in politics. I agree. Uh, but they're, they're doing a lot of good work apart from economic freedom. Uh, they're, they're studying efficacy of healthcare policy. Uh, they are supporting research on, on crime and, and appropriate uh, punishments for various sorts of nonviolent crimes uh, and other, other issues that, you know, cut across society more broadly. So um, I think as long as we at UK handle the gift appropriately and protect our own academic freedom, that's, that's, all, I can, I, that's all I can guarantee. And uh, I, I think we've done a good job with that institute so far. If you uh, care to go look at their website, there's a link to every event that, that we have hosted and to every paper that has come out of that funding. And, and you'll see that it's very uh, scientifically rigorous and not politically slanted at all. Uh, so I asked this same question yesterday of Dean Arnett, and so if, if I can, I'd like to ask it to you. Do you consider graduate students primarily to be employees or students, and can you compare your view to what you think the university currently feels? Well, gra graduate students, I think, are primarily students. Um, and I, I think as, as faculty, uh, our, our, first, our first mission is to make sure that graduate students are getting the educational outcomes that, that we are promising. Uh, and we need to facilitate that in, in, in many different ways. Uh, An essential part of graduate education is, is getting experience, a, practicum, a practicum, if you will. And in, in most traditional uh, doctoral programs in particular, that involves research that involves teaching and getting practical experience in both. The way that's executed at most uh, universities is through a combination of a graduate assistantship with some sort of, of tuition benefit or tuition waiver. Um, so what, what does that mean? It means, yes, you're a student. Yes, you're an apprentice faculty member. And uh, that's, that, that's my, my view of it. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't like to see uh, graduate students exploited, um, and I understand that that happens on a campus, not, not just here, but anywhere. And I would be vigilant about uh, supporting graduate education and making sure that graduate students are treated fairly given the work that they're doing. Um. How do you see internationalization, and how important to you is it that uh, to UK's? How do you see UK's future success tied to it being globally engaged in research, teaching, and service? Um, so we 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 are uh, you know a, a landlocked, land grant uh, university, uh, but we. We, we need to be globally engaged on, on all the dimensions that, that, that you mentioned. Um, it, you know, th and that's, you know, at one level, that's competitive. I mean, we, we, do not, we do not shape up well when you look at our percentage of international students in particular. We're, we're you know, we're below the norm for a university like ours. Uh, I, 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 I think we owe it to the, the students that come from Kentucky to build a more diverse student body where students can come and learn from other students from other cultures and learn how to engage in a, in a truly global community. So that, that, that's imperative just given our mission. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, a huge demand for US style education uh, overseas. And that, that is an opportunity for us. Uh, does, that, does that mean we should uh, you know, have, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent international students? No, but I think it means that we can achieve a balance of students from different countries around the world, uh, faculty representing different countries around the world, and engaging with universities in other parts of the world to do faculty exchanges. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is just wearing out. <laughs> uh, fa faculty exchanges, um, 
student exchanges, research exchanges. Uh, the, these, these are uh, things that, that in the Gatton College we've been working on ever, ever since I arrived, and they're, they're starting to come to fruition um, on, on all dimensions. I mean, we host a number of uh, faculty from other international universities in our, in our departments. We are we're getting a, a kind of a, a modest pipeline of students from China, uh, and the college is benefiting from all of that. So I, I would see as provost supporting continued efforts in globalization and, and, and uh, being personally involved in assisting with that. I think you I have a question I think follows up on the graduate education question, which is how do you see the relationship between graduate education and undergraduate education in terms of their imbrication, in terms of university focus and priority, or in any other direction that you might also want to take that question? Thank sure. you. Sure. Um, well, well, one, um, I think the most promising pool of, of, of uh, potential applicants uh, for our graduate programs are current set of undergraduates. Uh, and, and those relationships that undergraduates develop with faculty members while they are undergraduates can often lead to very fruitful collaborations uh, af after, after graduation and, and into a graduate program here. Um, that would also apply to certain professional programs, especially uh, for undergraduate students who, you know, may, may because of a personal interest, uh, you know, study, study in an area where there may not be an obvious employment opportunity, so maybe they, they could stay for an additional year and, and learn some additional skills at the master's level to complement what they've done at the undergraduate level and, 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 uh, and then have a better uh, work, have a, have a better outcome in, in the uh, work uh, marketplace. Um, there, there's also, I think, a, a role for graduate education in the in the mentoring and, and supporting of, of undergraduate research at, at UK. And I, I think ideas to formalize that could, could also be uh, a way to just improve the culture more, more generally as, it, as we think about graduate education. Um, so you mentioned uh, if, if we don't have a climate uh, on campus for diversity and inclusivity, um, we're not going to be competitive in, in the national or global market. Um, so as dean, what are some initiatives that you've undertaken um, to increase diversity and inclusivity and sort of what were the results of those? Um, and then in addition to that, as provost, do you have any concrete steps that you would definitely take um, to, to increase diversity and inclusivity? Sure. Thank you. Um, Uh, uh, I, I guess the, the, first, the first thing we did was uh, we, we designed this building with uh, a, uh, the intent of building community and fostering community. And if you look at, if you look at the spaces, uh, it improves how we all engage with each other and, and the architects did a magnificent job. I think the culture in our college has changed as, as a result of the design of the building and I think that, that was very deliberate. Uh, two, um, we, we have emphasized, uh, emphasized uh, diversity in our, in our faculty recruiting. So if you look over the last six years, I, I, I don't, don't have ex exactly the, the, the right numbers, but uh, upwards, uh, certainly over 30 uh, faculty searches and over half of those searches improved the diversity of our faculty, uh, either on gender, uh, ethnicity, or, or race, and, uh, and and what you have to recognize is that uh, you know while, while faculty do turn over, um, it's it's not a high rate of turnover. So to really you know shift the the, the ship of diversity around, it takes it takes a long time. But um, I think I think we are making strides there. Um, we are this year implementing uh, a set of uh, uh, let's say community discussions that are being facilitated by a professional facilitator uh, asking um, faculty, staff, and students to come together to develop actually a blueprint for diversity in the college. And that's, that's just getting underway this semester um, and, and will continue for the rest of this, this year. Uh, but we are, we are being very deliberate about it.
I'd like to return to some of your uh, comments that you made early on, and, and one thing I'd like to say is I do greatly appreciate hearing your recognition of the diversity of academic interests at this university, because what I believe we need is a, someone who can be a provost for all of us, not just for some of us, but all of us. I'd also like to return to your comments about post-graduation outcomes and about the upcoming legislative session. I read in the newspaper, nationally and locally, um, legislators making disparaging comments about the employability of certain majors. And I am interested in hearing your views on how you see academic programs would evolve at UK in the future. Should we be actually thinking more about preparing students for specific high paying jobs or preparing people to be more traditionally broadly educated in the model of the liberal arts. They're not entirely incompatible, but they do have very different goals, and I'd be interested in hearing your, your views on this. Um, per, first, uh, you know, thank, thanks for recognizing the fact that I do appreciate the breadth of, of disciplines on campus, and I, and I do see value in all of them. Um, the, in, in, in answer to the last, the last part of your question, uh, I, I think the answer is both. Um, and, and, and they're not, they're not in, incompatible. Um, you know, for, for a number of reasons that, that I won't get into, I have great appreciation, certainly for the humanities, uh, for, for, for most of the social sciences, and it's partly from my educational background and partly from, you know, from friends that I've made in many disciplines over, over the years. Um, and, and, and I know the challenges in particular of, uh, of, of proving the case to, uh, especially to parents, of, of the value of certain uh, degree programs in, in the workplace. But, but the reality is if you look, if you look at the, the whole picture, most all of our students do one of two things. They, they go to work somewhere or they go to graduate school. Um, you know, most of them don't go on in, into the unemployment line. And so we're, we're, we're doing something right across all of the disciplines. That, that being said, uh, it is part of our land grant mission to look at the needs of the state and to help the state with its workforce needs and help the state with its need to, to economically develop. And, and so, so, yeah, I, I, you know, one of the sources of information we have are signals from the legislature. And the legislature is an important constituent of ours. They happen currently to preside about $267 million a year to the university. So we, we do owe it to, to everyone on the campus to consider those, to consider those uh, signals from, from that market. Um, so does that mean some targeted investments in programs that help the workforce of, of UK and help, or excuse me, help the workforce of Kentucky and, and, and to uh, spur economic development? Yeah, I think that's consistent with our land grant mission. On the other hand, I think every student that graduates, whether they're a French literature major or an engineer, need, need to have certain skills that apply in the workplace. And certainly as provost, I want to make sure that we're, we're providing those skills. And, and, and it's, there's plenty of room in our curriculum because a lot of our students come here with, with a lot of credit hours already in hand. So I think there's room for us to, to focus on uh, helping our students prepare for job interviews or to think about how to translate uh, a, a set of skills from the humanities into something that's a very valuable uh, um, skill in the workplace. And my best friend from childhood is an English professor, and he and I have this discussion all the time. And, and so that, that's part of my appreciation for it. And, and he, he and I engage, he's in Chicago at a, a small liberal arts school, and he's facing the same challenges there, but it's coming from the parents and the students, not from the legislature. So this is not specific to UK, but I, I do appreciate the, the problem. So uh, you mentioned the, uh, the new tax on the tuition waivers the, that might go into effect in January. Um, I'd like to know uh, some specific things that you foresee yourself doing 
uh, to ensure graduate student welfare, but um, also what uh, what other rec what other things you see yourself doing, even if that doesn't go into effect, because there are already students that are living below the poverty line on these on these uh, on these stipends and uh, are forbidden from getting outside jobs. So, uh, in terms of addressing the uh, potential impact of, of, a, of a tax bill, and uh, I, I haven't been able to, to follow the news much today, but I've, I've been hearing that uh, some of these provisions are, are going back and forth at, 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 at this moment. But um, as, assuming that provision is, is still in there, uh, you know, one, I, I would have to figure out what the magnitude of that problem is. And, and so I would have to get the data and, 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 and do the math and figure out what the magnitude is. I, I mean, I, I, I do think that it's somewhat unfair to have the rules of the game changed after you've already made a decision to take your life in a certain direction. And, and so I, 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 I think I can convey that the university would, would do everything it can to kind of cushion that blow. Um, I'm not in the job yet, and it's not entirely my decision, but I certainly would do the math and make the case. Uh, on, on behalf of our students. Um, in terms of the general uh, state of, of, uh, of, of graduate students and their pay, you know, I think this is, this is an issue that, that the academic units um, that are, are offering doctoral programs need to address. They, uh, colleges have resources, they, they get resources, and they choose to divide them up in a certain way. Um, I, I, I think that being more strategic about uh, the, the, doctor, the size of doctoral programs in, in some cases, uh, being more strategic about uh, how we use doctoral students to teach rather than, than do research, um, you know, whether some money could be redeployed in a way to hire permanent teaching faculty to address critical teaching needs and, and repackaging uh, assistantships so that they are more competitive and, and better able to support uh, 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 you know, a lifestyle. Uh, th those are all issues that, that I think the colleges can, can address themselves if they want to. Certainly leadership from uh, above can be helpful, um, but I, I think ultimately that's up to departments and colleges to decide how they use those resources. Hi. Um, one thing that I think is really important for a provost is a, can I take this out? This kind of, is a, a lot of trust between the faculty and the provost and that relationship. And I kind of want to go back to the, uh, the deal for the Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise with Papa John and the Koch brothers. And whether you want to say or not, they are highly politicized donors. Um, you may not look into the political leanings of donors when you accept them, but they are highly political donors, and that deal was incredibly controversial. In fact, the faculty senate voted not once but twice against that deal. Um, and so, my question for you is: How can you? What is your plan to develop trust with a faculty when you have already had a deal where you went against the the wishes of the faculty in terms of the education of our of the students? Um. So uh, I, will, I will address the, the question in this way. Uh, one, at, at, every, at every step of the process, uh, I engaged faculty in our college, faculty in the economics department, um, was very transparent about what was coming, uh, got, got broad support from our college, which is primarily where the, the impact uh, of, the, of this gift is. And, um, and so within our college, it certainly, there was some controversy. We discussed the issues. Uh, we made some compromises. We made some, some joint decisions about how the institute would be administered. And, and, and then I, I, I think that the results um, have spoken for themselves so far. I, I think if you asked uh, any number of, of, of uh, colleagues on, on the faculty of the Gatton College, uh, that they would say on, in balance that 
the institute has been a positive force in the college. Um, be beyond that, uh, uh, I very early on in the process involved the, uh, the university senate leadership, uh, even inviting them to, to listen in on our faculty members, as, or on our faculty meetings as we deliberated. We went through the normal senate process. It was very rigorous. Um, there was, you know, a, a lot of heated discussion, uh, and it was all out in the open and out in the press. Um, we agreed to, to uh, uh, some oversight that was actually beyond the normal oversight that would be provided on other centers and institutes that are similar. So um, I'll just characterize that we made a very, uh, uh, had a very transparent process. We went through all of the normal processes. We got the institute established, and the results speak for themselves. And, and I invite you to go to the website and, and listen to some of, the, uh, some of the speakers and panel discussions that we've hosted, and to look at some of the topics of the papers that, that have been supported. I think those results just speak for themselves. So I invite you to look at the website. You've mentioned our status as a land-grant university with a three-part mission focused on research, education, and outreach. Could you tell us a little bit about your vision for outreach? Uh, um, well, my vision for outreach is, to, is that it's important and we should support it. Um, and it, it not only, it, it, that outreach not only benefits the state in terms of translating you know, our research and our knowledge into initiatives and into knowledge that, that help the populations uh, of the state improve their lives. But we also get reciprocal benefit from having uh, people from our community come onto the campus, into our classrooms, in, in, into, our, uh, in, in, into our buildings and participating in our programs. Our students learn from, from that outreach, our faculty learn from that outreach, and so I think it's a very synergistic relationship that is that is, that is essential. I'm going to read one of the written submissions. Um, recently, there have been a number of complaints filed with the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights regarding inaccessibility of digital information in higher ed. Where do you stand with respect to addressing and embracing accessibility and universal design campus-wide, universal design being designing products, services, and environments for accessibility from the outgo if possible. So um, will that be a priority for you, accessibility and universal design? If so, what level, high, medium, or low? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the short answer is yes, it will be a priority. Um, and, and I you know, mentioned earlier about our opportunities, particularly in online education. And you know, there, there are certain, certain people with certain disabilities that have certain challenges in accessing online programs. Uh, so given, you know, that we're, you know, we're starting, you know, from a, 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 a kind of a, almost at a, a beginning stage, if you will, um, and given the developments in technology and online education, I think we're in a good position to address those. Um, I, I think some of those innovations are going to take, um, you know, they're going to take some, some faculty input in terms of how they're implemented and, and and how that's reflected in the uh, online education infrastructure that, that needs to be built here, but it, it will be a high priority. Uh, so currently, graduate students don't retain control over the student fees they pay and don't have designated representation at the university level. And so i um, curious what your thoughts are concerning graduate student autonomy. Uh, it, can you be more specific about about what you mean about representation? Right. So designated seats reserved for just graduate students on different positions. So like currently on the board of trustees, the SGA president sits, but that's often an undergraduate. So there's not representation of graduate students directly like at that level and similar sorts of. And other similar yeah, university-wide. Yeah, upper administration so, levels. Um, and then the other question was about uh, about fees. Control of like student fees, so student government fees and activity oh, fees. Oh, so, yeah, got it. Um, not, not necessarily about program fees or, or course fees, but 
uh, uh, student activity yeah. fees and that, and that sort of the thing. supplemental yeah, fees. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, thanks for for clarifying. I mean, uh, you know, you know, one, I I think there should be uh, you know more transparency about about student fees in particular, how they're used, how they're allocated. Um, I, I I think the goal it, it, the goal of the faculty and the leadership at UK is to serve all our students, and with respect to this particular issue, uh, all, all I can say right now, given the limited information I have about, about the issue, is that I'm willing to listen and to engage a, a, about this, about the representation and, and about the fees. Uh, I just need to gain a better understanding of you know, all of the issues and the resources involved, but it's a conversation I'm willing to have as provost. We have time for one more question. Well, if I'm the last one, I think you'll. Is this, yep. You'll if, I, if I'm the last one, it has to be good. So I, <laughs> I apologize that this is. Uh, uh, you've been speaking in many ways to the need for various kinds of innovations in the university. I work for the teaching center, so I'm going to ask you a question about teaching. Um, I was going to ask just your thoughts of what does innovative teaching look like to you, and what do you see? the challenges or opportunities are right now for the provost office to practice this kind of servant leadership to support faculty efforts in this sure. area? Sure. Um, you know, one, there's not, there's not a, a single simple answer to the question of what innovative teaching looks like. In, in fact, it, it, it could take many different forms and many different contexts and likely very different across different disciplines. But um, I, I, cer I certainly think that, in general, it reflects a high degree of, of engagement between the faculty and, 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 the, and the students. It's, it's more than, than just the sage on the stage, so to speak. Um, I, I, I think there's, that, that there's experiential components that are important, i.e. practicing practicing what, what, what you're learning and, and getting a better understanding of, of, of the topic through, through practicing it. Um, and, and, and even uh, how students, especially undergraduate students, engage with research, especially, um, uh, and, and understanding the research process, I think is an important part of it. And then uh, students teaching each other, I, I, I think is an is a innovative, is a innovative uh, ap approach. There, there, there are lots of, of, of innovations going on all over campus. I, I think that um, inventorying what, what those uh, innovations are and, 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 prom and promoting them and demonstrating to the faculty at large that these innovations are possible. They're probably fun, both for the faculty member and the student, and they improve learning outcomes. And, and I, I think if, if if, if we approach the communication that way, and then there, you know, there's support for faculty who want to improve and innovate, uh, it's an incentive for them uh, as well, that you know, you'll, 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 see, you'll see more of these innovations popping up around campus. Would you take one more? We had a special appeal. Um, take, okay. Is it Hi, uh, my name is Seth Gaboys. I am an undergrad with the Psychology and Philosophy Department. And I want to start out this whole question by acknowledging that this is only a little over our time, that you've got so much that you want to say, and thus can't go into the specifics of words like synergy, innovation, and collaboration, only so much. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. Sure. Um, but you claim that the Coke money does not affect the day-to-day -day operations here. And foregoing whether or not that is actually the case, because you know arguments could be made for both sides, to me, the acceptance and use of that money can indicate a sign of where the university's mentality is at, an acceptance or at least complacence with, they, with their heavily political goals of gearing cu curriculum in a particular way in order to churn out students for the betterment of corporations, which to me, it seems like treating students as a means to a particular end for corporations and universities as opposed to treating the students for means, or uh, I'm sorry, ends in themselves. And so there's that, and some of your language concerns me. Um, you talked about the state of higher education needing to focus on returning on investments, which the Coke 
Foundation just did. Um, and you also mentioned us needing to use our resources as best as possible to achieve the overall objective. And so going back to words like synergy, collaboration, innovation, to me, with that kind of mentality, I'm sorry? Thank you. Um, those words could easily be filled with actions that use students as a means to an end. Um, and so getting to my question, um, what is the overall uh, objective for the university that you want to achieve? Thank you. Uh, you know, my, my vision is, uh, you know, my vision for this university is for us to be recognized as, as a world-class university um, that is, is uh, and, the, and the path to that success is, is not only on outcome, great outcomes for our students, but also great, you know, support for our great faculty, both in the teaching and in the research realms, and, 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 and also, uh, uh, you know, growing and investing in the faculty and the research enterprise and you know, gr growing the programs in, in uh, smart, meaningful ways. Um, we're in a great position. Uh, we, we, we are on the path to world-class status, and we can't let any of the challenges that, that we've talked about get in our way. I think we have to be creative and innovative and, and find our own way. Um, and and with, with due respect to you, Seth, um, it would take me an hour and a half to unpack the, the preamble to your question and address it, and, and we, we don't have time for that today, but if I'm in the role of provost